last year and a big part of what I have been doing during this year is trying to figure out everything. Got it. <laughs> Got it. Uh, it's kind of figuring out all the different commitments and all the collaborative projects we're involved in. And uh, I discovered this gem of a project that we have or of a program that we have jointly between UCI and San Diego State. So I'm, I'm very excited to see this and I understand most of you are grad students in this joint program. And uh, this is one that we've decided now we're I'm going to scale up and make even shinier. Uh, that's not why I'm here, though. But I'm really here because I'm also a roboticist. I spent the last 20 years of my career at Georgia Tech in Atlanta. I ran the Georgia Tech Institute for Robotics. I did a few other things. But my real area in robotics is multi-agent robots or swarm robotics. I've been interested in how do you get how do you get large teams of robots to do interesting things and. This has been a fun area to be part of because over the last two decades or so, a lot has happened. Uh, we now know how to do things that we really had no idea about 20 years ago. We know how to make robots spread out and form circles or squares or cover areas. There are all these distributed algorithms for making robots solve geometric tasks. So if you go to a robotics conference now and you say, hey, I know how to make when a real robots on the ground form a circle, no one is going to be that excited. Uh, I, I would be excited, but uh, it's kind of, we understand that field. Uh, and over time, I got more and more interested in the question of why should the robots form circles in the first place? What, what's special about circles? Why not a triangle? And in particular, let's say that I, I'm new dean at UCI, and I want to know what's going on. San Diego State. So I'm going to send my little spy robots to campus and they're going to be here for, let's say, four years, just hanging out, moving around a little bit, knowing what's going on. Should they form circles or triangles? Right? Uh, it's not clear at all what they should be doing. Uh, and this is known now as long duration. So robots that are deployed for really long periods of time. And I have gotten increasingly fascinated by the question of What's different when you deploy something for long periods of time as opposed to short periods of time? So something that's different, of course, is you got to make, make sure the, the electronics is ruggedized and waterproof, and you got to get the engineering done right. But are there differences in behavior? Uh, are there differences in the, in my case, control design that we need to think about? So what I want to talk about is my view of what's different about long duration versus short duration economy. And in fact, here is a an old video uh, from my lab, 15 years old, uh, and there, there's a handful of robots. They are uh, moving around in the lab. They're, we're broadcasting to them what shape they're supposed to spell something. And so they say R, and then they know what an R is supposed to look like. They're measuring relative displacements relative to the neighbors, figuring out who goes where in this assembly, and then they, they assemble it. And uh, this is a version of, of forming circles. We know kind of how to do this now. Uh, there are lots of labs across the planet where robots, as we speak, are doing similar things. And uh, I call this short duration. <laughs> One of these, the things these robots are doing is they're moving an awful lot. And if I'm deploying the robots for really long periods of time, campus in San Diego, in the snow, it's ever snow there, but let's pretend it does. It seems extraordinarily wasteful from an energetic point of view to be doing all of this. So mobility is one of the most costly things you can do if you're if you're out there. So how do we think differently about these snow robots in, in San Diego? So that's really what, what this talk is is all about. And the way I'm going to get there is through a it's really a story in four acts. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about something that we call the robotarian. It's a remotely accessible swarm robotics lab. And there's going to be a reason why I talk about the robotarium and it will become clear after a while. But then we got to talk about animals for a bit because nature is filled with animals that are out there for really long periods of time, right? That's what they do. So, what can we learn from ecology, uh, the study of organisms coupled to their habitat when we design our control strategies? Then I'm going to be technical for a little bit, uh, turning ecology into math, and then we're going to put robots in the snow. So that's how we're going to, to approach this, this talk. And to start with, I showed you this picture. 
actually, I showed you this video. I think there are 12 robots. Uh, there's something here that I'm not showing. And people like me that show videos like this. There's something hidden here that we're not showing. Uh, I'll show you what it is that we're not showing. It's this. <laughs> there's an awful lot of people standing around, grad students and postdocs. I have a motion captioning system mounted up in the ceiling that's very expensive, uh, basically providing indoor GPS. There's a camera for tracking what's going on. There's also a long history of writing device drivers for this robot. And just going from point A to point B is, is a weirdly complicated thing. In fact, I don't know, if those of you who work with robots, you know what a pain it is to get a robot to do something. To get 12 of them to do something at the same time. Just having 12 batteries to be charged at the same time is, is really not that easy. And uh, the con you're nodding because you, you feel my pain. <laughs> and the consequence of that is multi agent robotics as a field is it's vibrant, but it's a competition for who has the most money rather than who has the most good idea. And uh, roughly a decade ago, I was walking through my lab at Georgia Tech and uh, I was getting increasingly frustrated by this fact that, first of all, we're you know, this, but also I genuinely happen to believe that science should be about good ideas. About who has the most money. Uh, so we set out to solve that. And uh, the solution is not that hard to imagine, right? What we should do is we should make my robotics lab accessible to everyone. So basically, we wanted to build a remotely accessible form robotics lab where the robots were just there, ready to do things, and you could upload code, run experiments, get the data back. Uh, so I went to the US National Science Foundation. They have a program called the Major Research Instrumentation Program. And I said, I want to build this instrument that's going to be changing how we do robotics. And this is literally the picture that I have in the proposal. It's the Vienna Chamber Orchestra Concert Hall with some Harvard kilobots photoshopped in and some random things in the background. It looks kind of good. So I said, this is what I'm going to do. And then the said, good, here's the money, go build it. This is what I built. <laughs> Not quite the Vienna Chamber Orchestra concert hall. Actually, this was the first uh, version of it. So we did build a lab that was, uh, I wanted it to, to look different because this would now be a publicly available lab. I, I, described it as I wanted it to be a, a, a cross between a robotics lab and an Apple store. It needed to be, have a different kind of aesthetic vibe. And we went live in August, 2017. So pretty much exactly five years ago, we, we launched this thing. And there have been a few remotely accessible research labs produced before, not in robotics, uh, but there, there have been wireless networking labs, there is a cybersecurity lab, there is a smart grid dish lab. And one of the things that, so I talked to them before we built it, and the one thing they said is, no one is going to use it. You may build it, you may think it's great, but no one's going to use it. Why would you use this lab? Uh, so just because you have one doesn't mean you have users. So I spent a lot of time initially just trying to drum up business. Uh, there is a, a swarm roboticist at uh, UCSD, Volker Cortez. Is his name. Uh, I, he was my first user, and I basically just begged him, email me some code that I can put on so I can say that we run it. We also did a lot of media early on. Uh, you know, we were on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, and the headline was, this robot lab has no idea what these robots are doing, uh, which is the whole point, right? People upload code, they do whatever. So we did a lot of media early on. Uh, I worked really hard to get people to use it. So we had people using it, which was really bad because people started breaking stuff right away. <laughs> we made this thing available. We made sure we had lots of people. We have aerial pieces too to it. And when stuff collides in the air, stuff really breaks. So we spent such a big amount of time just making new uh, propeller blades for quadcopters. And, and the problem we faced, right, was this was a research engine. So I can't constrict or restrict what people should can do. They actually running bad experiments is part of research. So we need to allow for people to uh, submit bad code. We can't just say, hey, the only thing you can tweak is this parameter in the PID regulator, but then it's it's not a research instrument. So we gotta allow for people to submit strange code, but we can't have that. And 
one of the most fundamental problems uh, in robotics is really, you know, how do you just make sure stuff don't collide? Collision avoidance is the first question that anyone that studies robotics looks at. And this was uh, in 2007, DARPA had their urban challenge. This was before self-driving car companies existed. To the left, this is, I think, to date, still the most famous uh, robot crash. It's MIT's car to the right and Cornell's car to the left colliding. There's no one in it. And they are still, to this day, arguing over who was at fault, which is hilarious. Uh, I had a car. I uh, took a Porsche Cayenne, a beautiful car, and we did really well. We made it to the semifinals, and then for some reason, we drove straight into a wall. <laughs> and we can laugh about it now, but this is a year and a half of my life that just drove into a wall. It was horrible. Uh, we put a $200,000 Regal laser scanner in front of the bumper, which may not have been the smartest design choice. Point was, in 2007, we didn't know how to avoid collisions. And it's interesting because there is a now an ecosystem, of course, around self-driving cars. Uh, you know, all the major automotive manufacturers, more or less, are saying that they're doing autonomous vehicles. What's also interesting is kind of the, the secondary, the startups that are working uh, at different layers of the autonomy stack. I mean, there's a whole area, very vibrant, and part of what they now know how to do is avoid collisions, more or less. In fact, it's interesting, if you go to Google Scholar and you type in collision avoidance, so this was a few months ago, you, got, you get 687,000 hits. There's quite a few papers written about this. Uh, obstacle avoidance, a little over a million hits. So these are a million papers written about uh, obstacle avoidance. So one would think that this is solved. None of these methods work for what we were doing. And the reason for that is twofold. Uh, we really want to pack a lot of robots in there. And almost all algorithms that for collision avoidance are based on some variation of, let's say we have charges uh, that were both negatively charged particles. So we were repelled and then before the, the magnitude is something like one over the distance squared. So when we get close, all we're doing is avoiding each other. I want lots of robots really tightly together. Uh, the other is the standard model in collision avoidance is I should be safe no matter what you do which is a very conservative approach, I can have my robots collaborate. So I can, I want to pack lots of robots together. I allow collaboration. And the third thing that's different in the robotarium is I have no idea what the robots are actually doing. People have been smart about collision avoidance. When I know that I'm going over there, then I can actually plan a smart path. But since someone just uploaded code and literally just ran it, I don't know what the robots are really supposed to do. So I can't take advantage of knowledge of some higher higher order mission so the way we solve this is is really speak on someone i forgot your name ricardo so ricardo uploads code and i don't know what the code is doing what i'm going to do is i'm going to let the robots and at the end of the day the output of this code is going to be a control signal that tells the robots to do something i'm going to and we'll be precise with me by this in a sec I'm not going to allow them to run the code exactly as we want. I'm going to make it change so that I'm as close as possible to your code, subject to the robots should not reach to this side. That's how we're going to, going to phrase it. And this way of thinking about um, safety in terms of staying in a set, this is going to be a safe set, is known as barrier functions or barrier certificates. And here's how it works, right? So we have our robots. These are two robots. They are uh, on a collision course, but the arrows are green because it's mathematically possible to avoid the collision. The way we're going to write down the dynamics, so first of all, the state of each robot is going to be x to y. So it could be the position, it could be position orientation. If we care about dynamics, we would have to have velocities in there. If we care about orientations, we need angles. It really depends on what, what level of abstraction we're in. Uh, and we're going to use what's called the control affine form. Almost everything that lives in the world of Boyle Lagrange more or less has this, this form. So, what you have is what's called the drift term. This is the F piece. This is what the, the robot is doing if you're not touching the, the steering wheel or the gas pedal, which is what, what the drift is. And then you have the actuation dynamics. This is the G term. 
And then the actual control signal is if you survive. This is how you're affecting the state of the system through this differential equation. And for those of us who have taken control theory, some of you may have, uh, this is how we think about the world. We have a differential equation with a state that we want to make do interesting things, and we're wiggling the control inputs to make good things happen. So that's the model. The way we're going to think about safety is we're going to take the states of all the robots, put it in a joint big state space, and say, there is a set where we're safe. So this set is, for instance, where we're not too close to each other. So the name of the game is to make sure that the joint state stays in this lime green set. And as long as you're in the interior of this set, you're fine. It's like this picture there. You can do whatever you want. When you're on the boundary, you may not have collided yet, but you have to take evasive action because if you don't, you're going to collide. And when you're outside of the set, it's game over. You may not have collided yet, but there's nothing to do. It's like being driving a car really fast and close to the wall. You haven't collided yet, but you're out of luck. Uh, so the name of the game is to keep the states inside the set at all times. And we're going to encode this through a continuously differentiable scalar super level set function. So we're going to say that H is positive on the interior of the set. It's zero, the boundary, and it's negative on the outside. So the name of the game, instead of staying in the yellow set, is to make sure that H is greater than or equal to zero, no matter what we do. So here is one attempt then. So U sub N, maybe it should be U sub R for Ricardo. This is what he is telling the robots to do when he uploads code in the robotarium. At the end of the day, there's computer code. We don't really know what's going on. But at the end of the day, there is a signal being sent to the robots what to do. That's what's happening. And at any moment in time, we're going to minimize the distance between what the robots are actually doing and what we're telling them to do. Subject to the safety constraint, which is H always being non-negative. So you can write this down and feel good about yourself. The problem is that it is absolute and utter nonsense. And the problem is this is a cost involving some variable that we call U and a constraint in something else that we call X. And there is no coupling between them. So this is this is ill, this makes no sense. So somehow you need to combine, get the U in there, because U is my decision variable. We need a constraint involving U, and the only way to do that is through the dynamics. The dynamics is the way in which we couple state to input. So here's a key result. I'm, I'm going to show it to you because it's really simple and extraordinarily powerful. So I would like H to be greater than or equal to zero. Let's pretend that somehow by magic, we could drive H asymptotically down to zero. So H starts positive and then we could asymptotically drive it down to zero. Uh, there's a number of ways of doing this. This is called a, uh, a generalized class K function. Uh, so it has to have enough structure and it has to be nice enough but the point is this could for instance be h dot is negative h then this is an exponentially decaying thing it's just you can think of it as just minus h if you want but any function that will asymptotically drive this down to zero well if we had that then this would happen now there is something known as the comparison lemma that says that what if we're greater than or equal to that then we're going to get something that's greater than or equal to that which by the way Asymptotically approaches zero, so it's actually greater than or equal to zero. So that green for sure is going to be greater than or equal to zero all the time. So that is actually not a bad constraint. In fact, here's the theorem, right? So the theorem says that the safe set is forward invariant, which is fancy speak for saying if you start in the safe set, you stay in the safe set. So forward in time, so you start there, you stay there. If the control input satisfies this thing, for some extended class K, for some functionality, but we get the thing. I always pick H cubed because it seems to have the right property. Uh, but this is a statement that says, if I somehow can pick U such that this holds, then I know that I'm always staying in the safe set. And this may look messy, but it's actually not. So what is H dot? It's just the, the total time derivative of H with respect to X of uh, T, which is the gradient or, or the, derivative, the inner product between the gradient of H with x dot, which is the dynamics. So this is, this is the same thing. 
still looks a little intimidating, but you know what? We can rearrange some terms. And now we have something messy and weird looking times u greater than or equal to something messy and weird looking. So here's where we are. Something messy and weird looking times u greater than or equal to something messy and weird looking. The messy and weird looking is a function of x. We're going to, for, this, for the purpose of this talk, assume that we measure x. So that's just something we evaluate. We don't have to worry about this. This is a linear or affine constraint in u. This is a really simple constraint. So all of a sudden, the problem we have to solve is this. We've got to minimize the distance between what Ricardo wants my robots to do and what they do subject to a linear constraint. This is a quadratic programming problem. We can solve this blazingly fast. So all of a sudden we have something that's computationally cheap. We can actually distribute it. So we have the different robots solve different pieces of it. And this is what it looks like. Okay, so let's go back to this problem that we looked at. Uh, so this was actually not an experiment. This was, we were telling the robots to go through exactly the same point in the middle, which is a car crash, right? And now this constraint kicks in and we're not telling the robots what to do. All we're saying is follow this path subject to the safety constraint. And I like it because it kind of looks right. A lot of robotics, I hope you agree with me. A lot of times you look at robotic systems and go, eh, it's not exactly right, but I guess it'll do. This looks right. Uh, and I like that. Uh, also, it turns out that things like traffic circles just emerge from these constraints. Uh, and the trick to making this work is that they are collaborating. They're all solving the same constraint. It still works even if they're not all collaborating. So you have a big robot that says, I'm going for it. And these poor little robots have to run away, but so it still works, but it's no longer uh, minimally invasive. We also put it in the air. Uh, so this was uh, the one where we saw the crash. Uh, what we're going to see is we're going to see four robots spiral, and then a fifth robot is being piloted with a former student of mine. This is our mutual friend. Lee is the one who's behind a joystick, right. who's now building autopilots with Tesla. And Lee is trying to make this quadcopter slam into these, and the barrier functions just prevents that from being mathematically possible. Uh, so this is now running on the Robotarium. So let me show you what this looks like when you upload code on the, on the actual Robotarium. Uh, we're going to run the same experiment with a bunch, these robots are all going through the same point in the middle, and the barrier constraint kicks in uh, after a while. And it's remarkable how densely packed these robots are. And it's, it's remarkable that they managed to figure out how to do this without us telling them anything. We're just saying, hey, uh, here's the constraints. We have a hand in the air. So you started with, in theory, you started with a symmetric initial position. Uh, these guys are going to go to statistical. Yeah, they're so. They're going to the symmetry. So you should actually, somehow, because we know these structures are simple structures, to include some sort of angular momentum to the system, so always you will actually get things going in these round circles. Yeah, so uh, yes and no. Uh, so first of all, your point is absolutely right. We guarantee safety, we guarantee forward invariance. But we, doesn't get, we don't guarantee deadlock avoidance. You can get stuck. Uh, you're safe because, hey, look, doing nothing is perfectly safe. You're just not particularly useful. So you're right. Uh, I don't like adding particular terms because I know that this is a circle, because I don't know that this is a circle. I, I want this to run no matter what code you're uploading. But your point is you need some symmetry breaking mechanism. And uh, so absolutely. Uh, because we don't guarantee, this version doesn't guarantee deadlock avoidance at all. I don't like over designing for circular motions because what if they're not? Uh, but symmetry breaks are, are needed. Uh, so far, all I'm saying is safety though. And we, we will actually get to this point in a bit, but good observation and correct observation. Cool. Any other concerns? Yeah. So here it's all distributed and decentralized. Uh, what we're doing is when you're uploading, so the robot, the architecture of the Robotarium is you upload code. That code has code for every individual robot. It gets compiled down onto the robot and the robots are executing it. They are, so the beauty of this particular uh, barrier function is you can distribute it. You can distribute it amongst the agents. Uh, basically you cut it in half and say, I'm in charge of half the variable function where you're in charge of the other half. Uh, 
So this we can do in the distributed way. Not all variable functions can be distributed. Uh, yeah, there are, are some some nice properties you can uh, you can lean on in order to to show that they're what can be distributed and what cannot. In this particular case, we can it, but in general, there isn't a theory of. of we don't know what can be distributed and what cannot. We know that if it uh, has some submodular structure, we can actually push it down. But that's, yeah. So good point. Yeah. So that's uh, those of you who know control theory. Uh, Variable functions are directly related to the Lyapunov function. And the Lyapunov functions, they're beautiful. The theory is fantastic, but no one knows how to find it. There's a little bit of the same here. That this, how do you know that this is the right one in for, for collisions, it's not that hard. You can actually compute. What we did is we computed uh, uh, what happens if you slam the brakes and you steer maximally and then we back out that. So we know we have the right barriers for collision avoidance. But in general, you know, we've people, including myself, we've used some square technique to try to build them up. But it, various functions suffer from the same. Uh, the other functions, which is the theory is there and it's beautiful, but it doesn't really define it. Thank you. All right, cool. So let me tell you a little bit about where we ended up. So since we went live, so these numbers are, I think, a month old. So since August 2017, we've had 650 labs, so not people, labs, uh, participating and submitting code. We have over 4,000 distinct users. So when you submit code, you have to register and then you submit it. Uh, We've run, we're almost at 7,000 experiments now, uh, 250 papers, not by us. And the way we track this is we ask people that if you're writing a paper and you use the Robotarium as your experimental platform, cite this one paper. So we have one that we ask people to cite. So that's how we get, get that number. But this is kind of fun because you know what? 7,000 experiments, that's a big number. And right? we've, we've really, if you go to ACRA or IRAS now, so these are two of the main robotics conferences, you will guaranteed see a few Robotarium papers in there. Uh, we see a huge spike in submissions around uh, when the conference deadline is. And one thing that I'm excited about is we looked at where do people come from uh, when they submit code. And this is the breakdown. This was in, in 2020, so I assume it's roughly the same. Uh, so North America, yeah, they're, they're the biggest. Uh, you know, Asia, Europe. But then we have, we, have, we have labs in South America. And in particular, there are six labs in Africa that are used in the Robotarium. To me, that's success, right? even if there are only six. But you know what? We set out to democratize access. And I think in some sense, I am saying that this is, you know, we would like to see this a little more balanced. But I am very proud of this, this fact that we've been able to reach so many, so many people. Yes. To the risk of being extremely facetious here. Yes. Why do you have a robotarium instead of having just an uh, in silico programmable? Uh, yeah, oh, well, why well, just simulate it and be done with it? Yep. Uh, so you're not the first and you're not the last person to ask me that, and I'm having at least three answers to it. Uh, one is very pragmatic and a little silly, but it's still a real reason. If you're a roboticist and you deal in simulated robots, you never get published. You have to have robots in order to go to robotics conferences. You have to have robots in order to publish in robotics journals. The days when people were theoretical or simulated roboticists is past. Uh, Dan Kodicek, who is a famous roboticist, used to be at Michigan, he's at Japan now. He always said simulations are doomed to succeed. And part of it is you, you've got to be able to show robots to be credible. So that's one. Uh, I'm going to say that the real reason, though, is. When you scale up, stuff happens that is hard. To, so I would say if you have a perfect model, I personally don't think models, perfect models exist. I think that's an oxymoron. I think models by definition are approximations. But if you could somehow capture everything, then yeah, sure. But whenever you start scaling off, then there are weird things happening with crosstalk of the communications. There's friction that I never understand out the model. So we don't know how to do a rich enough model. And just getting to the right robustness that you need, you need robots. There is something about embodied uh, control design that just requires real hardware. At least that's, that's my take. And then the third is, 
as a source of inspiration and joy and getting students engaged. There's a simulated robot, there's an actual robot. This one is better. So those are my three answers. But it's it's a it's a valid question. Uh, part of our user base are people that have done things in simulation for a really, really long time and finally had a way of just Basically, it's not an experiment. It just, it's a demo that shows that, hey, the thing that I simulated that I know works actually also worked there. And now I use that in my paper. And so, yeah. But no, it's, it's a perfectly valid, valid question. I do want to show one thing, though. So I, uh, when the pandemic hit, uh, I got Jordan Tech to designate the Robotarium as a uh, critical piece of infrastructure. So we didn't shut down. I had this one postdoc that would show up every other Friday just to make sure that the thing didn't burn to the ground. But it was on. It was just there. The robots were sitting at the sideline. They're sitting at the edge of the arena, uh, wireless charging. And so they're always charged. And then when they're recruited to do something, they do it. And then they go back. And we started seeing a huge uptick. And since the pandemic, we've had over 10 submissions almost every day. Uh, and this comes from labs also that that have robots, but they had to go home. So all of a sudden we actually made a pandemic proof uh, uh, robotarium or experiment, which made, made me happy. Other things that we saw is we started seeing other domains. So this is the robotarium watch top power camera feed from uh, ETH in, uh, in Zurich, uh, where they now have the, the, what they call the Ducky Town Robotarium. Uh, there is a Robotarium Latin America that's being built in, uh, in Monterrey in, in Mexico, which makes me happy. We also saw labs connecting. So there was a paper written by a researcher at Tokyo Institute of Technology, where they were running experiments at the Robotarium and in Tokyo across 11,000 kilometers, trying to synchronize across very large uh, temporal and spatial scale. Uh, and then the democratized access. I was very excited about all of those. Which leads you, of course, to asking, what does this have to do with robots in the snow in San Diego? And the answer is, yeah. first of all, this thing has been on more or less nonstop for five years. So it is a long duration autonomy system in some sense. Uh, but it's not entirely a given yet why the robotarium tells me something about robots in the snow. And throughout my career, I have worked a lot with biologists. I really like looking at biological examples particularly in swarm robotics, right? I mean, nature is filled with schooling fish, flocking birds, or lion prides that are hunting in certain formations. It's, it's, it's a gorgeous, endless source of inspiration. Uh, to understand robots out in the snow for long periods of time, why not look at other things that are out in the snow for very long periods of time? The Arctic fox. So I started working with ecology. So ecology is really the study of organism and habitat and the coupling between the two. Uh, and I am not an ecologist, I should tell you that, but I have given, talk, have given a plenary at the robotics uh, an ecology conference. And I'm going to tell you what I've learned about ecology. So here's what I've learned about ecology. We're going to build an animal. So let's say for some reason we insist on the animal that we're building. It's going to be a what's called a folivore, which is fancy speak for leaf eaters. We're going to build a, uh, an animal that eats leaves. Well, function and form are intimately linked in terms of these organisms. So now the function is we're going to be leaf eaters. Leaves are really complicated foods. They are structurally really hard to break down. They're a lot of times also toxically protected. Plants want you to eat their nuts and fruits. They don't want you to eat your, your power generators, the leaves. So animals that are folivores need to have a long enough digestive tract to break down this horrible food. They need to have a big enough gut, right? So elephants and giraffes, cows have multiple stomachs. Folivores are big animals because they're living such a, a complicated life in terms of their diet. So we want the folivore. We would also like it to be an arboreal animal, to live in trees. Now that seems weird because you're gonna live in a tree. You can't be too big because then you're gonna fall out of the tree, right? You, and we rarely see elephants climb trees. Uh, so animals that live in trees tend to be, that spend all their lives in trees, particularly, uh, tend to be very small. So I wanna build an arboreal folivore, a tree dwelling leaf eater. It turns out that nature has solved that, but only a few 
examples. And in the mammalian world, they're rare. This is a three toed sloth. There's something called a two toed sloth. Uh, in the middle, there's something, this is a slow loris, this is a koala. There are a few lemurs that fit this niche. They're all between three and eight pounds, so roughly the same size. And they all don't do anything. They just sit there because their lives are so complicated. They're living such energy constrained lifestyles because they barely get enough to eat because they have to spend so much of the time breaking down this horrible food and their digestive tract isn't big enough to make sense of this food. So it, it's not an easy life. And I decided I'm going to put robots out there for long periods of time. Let's learn from these animals that are hyper energy efficient. So I started reading up about sloths. I thought they were amazing animals. The three-toed sloth, this is not the cute sloth you see on YouTube. That's the two-toed. The three-toed is kind of nasty. It has algae on it. It, it, it. it spends its entire life in one to two trees. It's extraordinarily lazy, except every now and then, every two weeks or so, it will climb down the tree, go to the bathroom, and climb back up again. And I thought that was so weird. Turns out that energetically, it's by far the most costly thing a sloth will do. It's also extraordinarily dangerous. So the, the, the paper I read about it described it as running a marathon while being attacked in order to go to the bathroom. That's how it was described. So why I did. They, why don't they drop the thing from the, from the tree? Instead of going down. <laughs> That's what I've been doing. I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, there, that, there's that's you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. I, I, I'm going to turn to that in a bit. But, but I had the same question as you. I was like, what the hell? This makes no sense. Like, why, why do they do that? Uh, and I had started talking to a sloth ecologist. So I asked him, why, why do they want to climb down the tree? Literally, why do they want to climb down the tree to go to the bathroom? And what he said, so this is John Powley at the University of Wisconsin, he said, that is absolutely the wrong question. An ecologist would never ask, why does an animal want to do so? An ecologist would ask, what are the constraints imposed on the animal by the environment that forces this behavior to emerge? It's all about, they talk about environmental constraints, something they call it ecological pressures, but it's all phrased in, what are the constraints on this animal or this organism that forces this to emerge? And- Can I ask a question? No, you're about what to- are, What are the constraints for the <laughs> because? So, of course, <laughs> so <laughs> you're ruining my phone. <laughs> so, me, let's ignore this guy. Uh, <laughs> me being who I am, I, I sit down and I start talking to, to John, and I find this super fascinating this idea that without constraints, animals don't do anything. The exception to that, by the way, is mating, and this will play a role in the answer about climbing down this tree. So, mating is a strange thing that doesn't seem to follow the normal ecological rules. but if you take mating out of the equation, robots basic, animals basically only move in as a, as a function of these constraints, which me being who I am, I went, okay, so this is what they do, right? Mean u squared, so energy spent, subject to don't die. Mm -hmm. We gotta figure out what that means in a sec. But, but I actually told John, is this how we should think about all of ecology? And he said, yeah. <laughs> so I gave my plenary at an ecology conference where I, postulated this and uh, the ecologists were uncomfortable but kind of okay with it uh, so the bad news is life is meaningless right you should sit on the couch as much as you can and every now and then go and get a snack and that's it it's extreme existential nihilism if you will uh, so that would be, be it uh, so I, I i'm going to return to your questions in a bit but why not do this why not tell the robots to do nothing do absolutely nothing Subject to don't die. And we got to figure out, you know, um, give some life to don't die, pun intended. Uh, but basically, long duration autonomy, maybe we just tell the robots to do absolutely nothing. That's the instruction to the robots. All right. So let's figure out what don't die could possibly mean. Because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mouthful. Remember, we had something that we call these barrier functions. Right? And uh, I said they need to be scalar, continuously differentiable. Is, is don't die a scalar, continuously differentiable function? Seems to be asking a lot for, for something like that. So let's go back to this where we left it off. Right. So I said this is this is a quadratic program problem. 
can be solved in real time, blazing it fast, it's all good. The theory says that if you is selected such that this constraint is satisfied, then the safe set is rendered forward invariant. There are some things that are making you nervous. One is, how do I know that such a U exists in the first place? I don't. In the collision avoidance, you can show that slamming the brakes is always a solution. So you know one solution exists, which means solution exists. But in general, it only says if a solution exists and U is selected to solve it, then we're fine. We don't have guarantees. And then we have the, the complaint about deadlock avoidance. We don't know anything about that. We can't guarantee it without breaking symmetry. And then, I don't, don't die seems to be a, a, a big question. Uh, so I want to say a little bit about how do you make more rich and more interesting barrier functions out of different smaller functions, because that's ultimately what we're going to need. So we're going to look at Boolean composition. So let's say that I have two sets. I have C1 and C2. They're super level sets. So let's say that uh, I would like an AND conjunction. Well, from a set theoretic point of view, AND is trivial, right? It's, it's the intersection. That's it. It's the, the part that they have in common. So if I'm in C1 and, and I'm in C2, then I just need to be in the intersection. This junction, or Says, oh, I want to be in that one or that one. Well, it's the union. So that theoretically, this is completely uncomplicated. But that's not enough for me. I need I need barrier functions, right? So the question is, how does this translate into barrier function? So let's say I want H1 to be positive, and I want H2 to be positive. Well, that's equivalent to saying that the smallest of the two should be positive. So it turns out that conjunction and is equivalent to min. It's the min operator. Similarly, if I want h1 to be positive or h2 to be positive, that's not surprisingly equivalent to saying that the max is positive. So this junction is equivalent to just picking the max. I get a little bit of an issue when I'm dealing with not or negation because at the boundary, so not h being positive is the same as minus h being positive because it, but because it's greater than or equal to. I have a problem at the boundary. Uh, it turns out that my logic is intuitionist logic and not classical logic, but I don't worry too much about this. So uh, if we squint at the boundary, uh, so let's squint at the boundary. We now have a complete Boolean algebra. We can, we can say whatever we want about these systems. The only problem is that min and max are no longer smooth operators, where you have two functions crossing over at the moment of crossover, you, you lose differentiability. So you got to deal with the non-smooth version of this. You can, you basically get a set value gradient, but you can still move on. So the tools are there. There is the whole machinery on, on non-smooth analysis that, that still works. So from our point of view, we can do and, we can do or, which is min and max. So let's do it. Let's look, look at one example. We have four robots, a blue, a green, a red, and a yellow. And I would like the green robot to follow some, some green U. That's my, the nominal trajectory for the green robot. And I want the green robot to be safe relative to all other robots, relative to blue, and green, and yellow, and red. And, and safe just means far away enough. That's what it means. And I want the green robot to be close enough to the blue robot. It needed to be connected. The blue robot should follow the blue trajectory. Uh, it should be safe and connected to the green robot. This is now what's called the communication backbone. The two of them are connected. Uh, the red robot should be safe and connected to the blue robot or connected to the green robot. So it needs to be connected to the backbone, but we don't care where, and similarly for the yellow. And now, if we run this, again, we can run this. It's still a quadratic programming problem. This is the nominal trajectory. The thick red line is the one that needs to be maintained between blue and green at all times. And you know what? This is pretty complicated stuff. People write papers about uh, connectivity preserving collision avoidance, but this just came out of these constraints that we now wrote down as min and max operators. Uh, you know, there's stuff going on, but, but at the end of the day, connectivity is guaranteed, they never collide, and they're staying as close as possible in this least square sense. To the, to the nominal trajectory. Uh, you know, this is 
think the robotic equivalent of climbing down a tree to go to the bathroom. It's complicated and it emerged as a consequence of, of constraints. Cool. So now I think we're ready, right? We can compose things. We can do it by min and max operators. We know that what we want them to do is don't die. I have gotten very excited about environmental monitoring as the application that I'm spending my time on right now. I happen to believe strongly that there's only one question that matters at the end of the day is how do we make sure we leave a, a planet for our grandkids that's not burned to the ground? Like that is the question. And everything else, if you can't solve that, it doesn't matter if we can solve other problems. So I want to use the robots for environmental monitoring purposes. Um, so that's the application we're going to look at. And there have been some work done on environmental monitoring. I think precision ag is another closely related field uh, where you, the idea is that you have robots out for entire growing cycles in the farm fields tending to individual plants. Uh, but, but that's kind of the, the broader application domain I'm interested in. I also want to brag a little bit about UCI because last week uh, in the New York Times, uh, Tirtha Banerjee, who is an environmental engineer, he was in the New York Times with his drone monitoring wildfires, which I thought was, was cool. So not my work, but uh, still cool. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to do environmental monitoring. Uh, I'm not going to be spying on you here at San Diego State. I want to know things that's going on in the environment. And uh, for that, we want to send robots out. And to the left there, this is uh, a Basically, where are the, the pride, the territories associated with different lion prides in Tanzania? It turns out that they form uh, power born on tessellations. Basically, you get the same amount of stuff in your territory, and the stuff is water and zebras that you can eat. So, same thing, there's a, a series of really influential papers on the selfish herd. Uh, Hamilton wrote the first one in, in 71, and it turns out that if you, if you move, towards the center of your region of dominance. That's a, a viable strategy for individuals and for the herd as a whole. Again, you get these hexagonal Borno tessellations coming out of it. They show up all the time in nature. So why do we use that as part of what don't die means? You get to have a, a, a region of dominance, a territory that you're in charge of, and you want this to be big enough. So don't die is going to mean, don't collide. We know how to do that now. And Always have enough power to return to a charging station or somewhere where you can recharge the batteries. Because if you get stuck with depleted batteries in a cave somewhere, it's game over. And cover is sufficient to big area. So your region of dominance needs to be big enough or charge the batteries. That's what don't die means in this particular context that I've been interested in. So we do this. We put this on. This is the old version of the Robotarium that I'm still using. I'm telling them, don't do anything. Min U square. Subject to this don't die condition that we just wrote down, here is the charging strip. They're just going to hang here. We're going to have to fast forward a lot because nothing is happening. Uh, it's just doing it. And then after a while, I think it's the fourth quarter, this robot, yeah, it, it runs low on battery. The constraint is forcing it over to the charging station. It's going to have to push one out of the way and we keep going. Again, the instruction to them is min u squared. Don't do it, don't move at all, right? Subject to this, this constraint. And I, I really like it that we're getting fairly rich motion out. This is, this is rich and it's constraint driven as opposed to, let's say, the classical way of doing robotics, which is goal driven. In fact, you know, this is, this is the battery. Uh, I got so excited about this idea that I started talking about robot ecology, this idea of driving robotic behavior with constraints rather than with goals. And my, of course, uh, as part of this, we got to put it on, on a robot that is, or is probably a team of robots that look like slots, because it started with slots. So we built the sloth bot. Uh, the sloth bot is a wire traversing robot that we used for monitoring what's happening, the microclimate under the tree canopies. Uh, we were working with uh, different organizations. We were geared up to send uh, the sloth bot down to Ecuador to be in the rainforest and the pandemic hit, so that never happened. But it's, it's a, it's a wire traversing robot that is doing nothing subject to don't die and don't die. It's solar powered. And so we, this was an early, early experiment. Uh, the way it ended up looking is you can cover it like this, like a sloth. This is the Atlanta Botanical Garden where 
we went in May 2020, so right when the pandemic hit, and we put it up. And it was up there for a year and a half, just hanging out on the trees. Then as the botanical garden started opening up again, people started going there. They wanted to know about the hashtag slotbot became a thing on Twitter where people were claiming that they saw the robot move, even though it probably didn't because it's just sitting there. And in all honesty, it was, it was measuring things having to do with when you're fancy, you say microclimate data. If you're not fancy, you say things like humidity, luminosity, carbon dioxide, uh, barometric pressure. So things having to do with, uh, with the local climate. Uh, but not only that, I decided that this is a thing now. So I, uh, spent, I spent the pandemic writing a book with the Princeton University Press on robot ecology. So it came out in January of, of this year. Uh, basically revisiting a lot of robotics through the constraint-based lens rather than the goal-driven lens. And the question is, what can we recover? What are things that are different when you start talking about constraints rather than goals? And uh, some people, they you know, learn how to bake sourdough breads during the pandemic. I, I wrote the book about robot and, and ecology. Uh, so with that, I want to say thank you. Uh, this really had a diff few different pieces to it. Uh, the Robotarium, if you're interested, you should check it out. So it's still at Georgia Tech, the remotely accessible one. I built one at UCI that we haven't put online yet. So the idea is we're going to start federating the two Robotariums. So the Georgia Tech one is still available. You should check it out uh, if you want to. I also think there's something really powerful about thinking about constraints and sets rather than goals. So if you have two costs right, and you want to combine them, how do you combine two costs? You can add them together. You can do a half of this plus 1.7 of that. You can multiply them. You can take the logarithm of that. There is no canonically correct way of combining costs. It just doesn't exist. You have to make a decision about how you combine them. Or you do what's called multi-objective optimization, where you get one of these Pareto optimal fronts, but then you still got to decide where on the front you're going to be. So you have to make a decision. If you can find a way to choose those. That's right, but you still have to have a secondary choice mechanism. Sets, well, unions and intersections. That's canonical. There are no choices involved in that. So I actually think there's something really pleasant about thinking about, so I spent a big part of my career doing optimal control and I like solving optimization problems. There's something pleasant about this canonically correct way of combining things. Uh, now, if I'm building a spot welding robot on the manufacturing floor that's doing this over and over again, you better believe I'm minimizing a cost, right? I want to minimize certain things. I want precision. But when I'm sending robots out for long periods of time, I think this idea of thinking of constraints is, is a very natural and powerful new way of thinking about it. Uh, so I should also say that there, this, uh, if there's anything that you enjoyed with this, this work, it was probably due to uh, uh, members of my lab or, or collaborators. I've been lucky to work with some, some really great, great people. Uh, if there were things in this talk you didn't like, I suggest you blame the organizer for inviting me. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, that's that. I'm going to answer your question about slot in a sec, but uh, for now, I just want to say thank you. I have a question of, uh, about the robot tool. Yeah. Um, so, uh, when you uh, deploy the code, I want to apply my code on the platform. Yep. Then, uh, does the computation happen offline at the laptop? In the you know, to do the input signals, you can do this on the remote laptop or offboard of the robot. Yeah, so that's a that's a good question. I, I'm going to say a little bit more about the the architecture in general. So first of all, we when we started out, we used ROS because the robotic operating system because that seemed like the way to go. Turns out that a lot of our users didn't know how to use ROS. They were they, they were MATLAB users, and particularly people that were studying social insects, or even we've had you know, people that are studying social networks. They don't use ROS, so we had to in the beginning turn it into MATLAB script. Now we have a ROS version, we have a Python version, but but uh, the point is you upload code that the most basic version looks MATLAB. -y. And then you can make decisions about what kind of dynamics. Do you want to pretend that these are points? Do you want to do kinematics? Do you want dynamics? What kind of sensors? And the sensing piece is hallucinated largely. Uh, so we have a central computer that computes 
what would the robot have seen if the robot had a laser scanner? These robots don't have like laser scanners. They do have uh, uh, infrared that uh, and I am using. You, you make some choices, and uh, in the beginning, we actually parsed the code out into uh, so, so that they were running locally on the different robots. It turned out that that was more hassle than it was really worth because ultimately we decided our sweet spot is these algorithms that people have for distributed systems. We're not going to care about whether or not the theory is right that this is truly distributed. Instead, we're going to give you a platform where things move according to what you said. So then what we do is we actually do it centralized and then we send the individual. So that's how we did it, why we do it now, not how we thought it, but that's how we do it now. Just because people didn't seem to care too much about that particular aspect. And I wanted to make my life as easy as possible. So that's how, how we did it. Thank you. But, but we had all sorts of weird problems. The first thing that happened was also that we have every hacker on the planet started trying to bring down the robotarian. So we had to, in the beginning, you could run code directly. Now you can't. What you do is you upload code, you get placed in a queue. We have some, we're working with some, we worked with some cybersecurity people to just make sure there's nothing nefarious in the code and then you get to deploy it. So now you don't deploy it in real time. You deploy it once the code has been checked for not being super bad. Does that mean if there is application if there is need for interaction between the robots then this uh, information is still sent back to the laptop and the processor there and then sent back you mean the communications yeah yeah so, so comms we have different versions but the small robots that's exactly what's happening we're, we're okay. faking it uh, the other thing that you could have asked that i'm going to pretend that you ask sometimes people want to try their new collision avoidance algorithms right so if you have to run with ours then you're not testing yours so the way to get us to shut off the variable function is you just you got to tell us what 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 you want what you want to do and then we say yes. Uh, but you get the log back also that shows if the barrier functions were active or not, so that you can actually see whether or not our modifications of your code played in. To some people that doesn't matter at all. To some it matters a lot, right? And then for those people, we we got to turn it off. I think it was you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it seems like for each robot, you're solving an ODE. And then if you add more and more robots, you're simultaneously solving a system of linear ODEs. Is that do I understand it correctly? No. So the ODE is the dynamics. Uh, so we're not solving ODEs. That would be too hard for a simple man like me. What we're doing is we're solving a quadratic programming problem where the constraint comes from the ODE, but it's just an algebraic constraint. Uh, it's true that if you don't do it right, that constraint becomes bigger and bigger the more robots you have. But we're not solving all these. If, if we did that, I think it would be game over. So it's just that the constraint came from a differential equation, but it's an algebraic constraint. Is there like a cap or a number of robots that if you added too many, it got too bogged down in function or? You ever hit that limit? So we haven't hit that limit. We have pushed it over 100 in the robotarium. Uh, the trick, though, is, and with the collision avoidance only, that's what we've been looking at there. Uh, the point, though, is you can compute who you have to worry about and who you don't. So if I have to worry about every robot in the world, then, yeah, we would get bogged down somewhere. I don't, we haven't tested that, but I'm going to make an uninformed guess, 32. Uh, but since you, we only look at robots that, are, that we could collide with, you can actually find what that bubble has to look like. And then you only care about those robots, robots that are far away, we just ignore. So you, you limit the number of actual interactions you have to worry about. And you can also compute how many robots can possibly fit in there. And I think the number we ended up with was six. So you never have to worry about more than six robots. So we haven't hit that limit, but certainly all these, if there are pairwise interactions between all the robots, yeah, life is gonna there, there will come a point where you get bogged, you, you get bogged down for sure. Even even something as as simple as a quadratic program on a small computer with a large constraints. Yeah, you like to come some company. I have a follow-up follow -up question to that one. How do you make sure that your constraint and to convert to a x uh it's a linear one, right? You linear it where like uh, no 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 yeah no the, the point is a of x is nonlinear and messy. Uh -huh. But u is my decision variable. Right. And because the dynamics is control affine, 
it enters linearly. So the messy part is in X. And there I have a model. I just put in my X. I assume I measure it. Uh, so there is no linearization needed because U enters linearly. And the only thing I care about is U. So I'm like, a love sign. The only thing I care about is U. Yeah. At that moment, AX and BX are constant, are constant. At that moment in time, it is, right? So that's exactly it. Now, a really big problem is, and you're all thinking this, how did I get X? I don't have X, I have to estimate it. And now when I don't have X, I, I get some uncertainty involved in it. So you got to do some robustification techniques. Robust barrier functions are still, I, I mean, people work on it. I've worked on it. I don't think it's done yet. Uh, I think it's, a, it's an area that, that requires more inquiry. Uh, what people typically do, including myself, is we just, we just blow up the safe set a little bit and say, oh, we're safe also to this extra tolerance degree. But now we've lost, we made the system more conservative. And I started by saying, I want to pack lots of robots together. So how do you deal with uncertainty in your very functions? And even better, I am okay with some collisions. It's just, I don't want really fast head-on collisions, but if the robots touch each other, that may be okay. Just a little bit. I mean, in nature, I mean, you, you've been on subway stations. We bump into each other all the time. It's okay, but we should not be running head first into each other. So, so this idea of dealing with those questions in a, in a systematic way and in a, in a mathematically precise way, I think is a really interesting question. Yes. I'll, you know, I'll try to express this as clearly as possible with the portable vocabulary. Uh, so the, I'm going to give a really confusing the, answer. The, the barrier function that you used in your example, from my understanding, this is total emergent behavior, right? So the decomposition or the composition was then distributed on each individual agent. So if you have something like the last one, what stuck out to me was uh, patrol some certain area. Yeah. Like if you're doing environmental monitoring, you need some type of coordination, right? So all the collaboration here was emergent. Yeah. But what if you need explicit collaboration? Does that change? I mean, I guess my question is what happens? Does that change? Yeah, so that, that's a well-phrased question. Uh, so there are two ways of, of, of thinking about this. I've been thinking it about it in terms of, remember I had this U nominal when we started in the Robotarium. So instead of going all out and saying, I'm gonna min U squared. Instead, I'm gonna go back to where we started, which is there is a nominal behavior that's coordinated. And I'm gonna get as close as possible to the nominal behavior subject to don't die. That's one way of putting it in. You can also, and then we've looked at this, encode certain types of collaborative behaviors as constraints and just put it in as yet another constraint. Uh, not quite as elegant, so so it, it becomes a little clunky when you start trying to make something fit that doesn't naturally fit. So my thing, the way I think about it now is you have a nominal coordinated behavior and then you have these lower level. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the, the, okay, yeah. I think it's a similar question. When you have a swarm of robots and you want to do cooperative Yeah. Not all robots have the same form of set, right? That they wanted to do it in the How do they even find it? What, what is the mechanism to do very much? How do you get that information out that I have somebody whose battery is going to die soon? And yeah. Is that only that robots made? Yes, or so. Also, this would be the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so in, in the examples I showed, uh, what you need is relative uh, displacement. So, I need to know where you are relative to. I don't need to know anything about your battery level, but that's because we didn't care that much about you know optimal scheduling of charging. We just want to make sure don't die. Right? But if I want to do something smarter in terms of making sure that we never have more than one robot over at the charging station, for instance, then you would have to do it. Then I, I think this is not the right approach. Actually, I think you should have you should do with the scheduling on top of. You can still have a low level safety thing. I would still have run a beautiful barrier-based collision avoidance routine underneath the hood, but the higher level behavior would be scheduled. Uh, so, so this goes back to, again, there is no right or wrong answer here. We don't know how to do this and people are arguing of, of it. I would put it in as, this is the cost I'm trying to minimize and then I'm adding my safety constraints that I would have coordination, I would have scheduling, I would have things that seem important to me from an optimality point of view. Uh, there, there. 
still room for cost. Would it be fair to conclude that hierarchy is necessary, but not maybe barrier functions aren't the answer at every hierarchy? So I think that's absolutely right. The other thing that I, I, I've been thinking about is this idea that if solutions exist, and if you pick you such that this constraint is satisfied, then you're forward in learning. What if solutions don't exist? Well, there are some things like don't drive into other things that's really important and then there are other things that may not be quite as existentially threatening like you know always be able to talk to that person over there you know maybe maybe there's a hierarchy of constraints as well as a way of you don't have a, a solution to these two constraints but one you're willing to one is not existential so you can thought it so I, i've been also thinking about our hierarchies as a way of dealing with the lack of uh, feasibility of the solutions and now I'm going to talk about slots, for example. So why do slots climb down to go to the bathroom? Uh, there are two answers. And if you Google it, it's funny. People are writing papers. People are arguing a little bit about this. Uh, the three-tone slot is, uh, has these uh, flightless moths in their skin that's tending to the algae. So they're, they're basically the gardeners. It's a mutualistic relationship. And these moths don't have wings. But they need to lay their eggs in excrement. So the sloth goes down, goes to the bathroom, the moth jumps off, lays their eggs, and jumps back off. So it's a way of creating baby moths for the sloth. So that's one. Um, the other is anything weird has to be mating. mating. It turns out that if you're living all your life in a tree, how are you going to attract the mate? The more the more vibrant your pile of soft crap is, the, the more attractive you are. And so it turns out it's the males that do this. And the females go, oh, look at that. It's a way of, it's a, do the females have to go down the street? No, so the females don't, they, but they see here, it wants to be a very vibrant soft. So it's a very the females go down. Yeah, so it's a very impressive male out there. It's weird. So it's basically a, an online dating profile. <laughs> we have one last question over there, and then we going back to the Ethereum and the statistical results of the twenty thousand experiment. Has there been something that is applied to this experiment? Or do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, there are a few things that that we we were really surprised by. Uh, the first one is. People are weird about, oh, I need a humanoid. How come you're not putting a humanoid in there? I'm really angry at you for providing a service for free. That's not exactly the way I want it to be. Right? We have, people get, get very upset about not being exactly the way they thought it should be. And I was very insistent that this needed to be free. So that surprised me. The other thing that quickly surprised me was companies started using it. And now I need to come up with a funding strategy because if you're, if you're Siemens or if you're BMW, then they will not pay. They can pay so we uh so so that was kind of just in the behavior side uh the one thing that i i wouldn't say that it surprised me that much but i didn't anticipate is what people are doing with these robots and, and the we have a projector where you can project down scenes into the arena and the types of scenes that we've seen we've seen underwater landscapes we've seen corn rows we've seen urban canyons we've seen all sorts of weird things that just some of them are, are really creative and fun and the beauty of just letting so something like letting there be a projector or people project things down really elevated the whole thing so no i wasn't lots of things that we didn't expect people have done but that people really leaned into this and took advantage of that this was there was just more joyous than maybe surprising more joyous than surprising. I think that's a good way to. Exactly. Yeah. That note, we're going to thank our speakers. Thank you. And we're going to take our speakers to the